Dr. John R. Lee is a retired physician and respected author. During his 30 years of medical practice, Dr. Lee became concerned about the increasing incidence of osteoporosis and other hormone-related ailments facing his female patients, and he sought to find the cause of these ailments rather than to simply treat the symptoms. Dr. Lee learned that hormone-related problems facing women in America today do not exist in many other cultures. He also learned that a natural and inexpensive solution has been readily available for many years. He has recently published a book with Virginia Hopkins entitled What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Menopause, which draws on his many years of research. The book contains very important information for women of all ages on a wide range of women's health issues. Listen now to a recent speech given by Dr. John R. Lee in Atlanta, Georgia, before an audience of 500 women. Thank you, Pastor Barbara and uh, Pastor May. Um, it's a true pleasure to be uh, here in Georgia, and I do compliment everybody who came out in the rain. And uh, uh, coming over, I was telling Mrs. Allen uh, that when I was in England last summer, I spoke to, um, in a beautiful room, not as big as this, but a very nice room at St. Andrew's College uh, and a medical school and hospital, which is on the Thames River just across from the Parliament. Uh, it was about a three, 400-year-old room, and 125 doctors were there, and I spoke from 10 o'clock in the morning to 5 in the afternoon on this topic with a lunch break and a tea break. And she said, well, you've only got an hour or two at the most here, but fortunately Georgia women are a whole lot smarter than those doctors in England, so we can get it all in. We can get it all in in an hour. It's kind of strange um, being here. I was thinking last night, I probably have a better idea what you people are doing here than my being here. I think that the people who are here today have an awareness that there is a problem uh, shaping up in this country having to do with women's hormones, and part of the problem is that the response by conventional medicine is not uh, 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 working as well as it could, and there's something wrong here. Something wrong is going on, and uh, women realize that they have to educate themselves, they have to acquire knowledge, they have to make tough decisions in their life, because um, there are some bad things that are happening to women that uh, we're not prepared for, and the response of the uh, conventional uh, doctor uh, is actually part of the problem, as I'm going to explain. So I think I know why you're here. Um, why I'm here is a little more difficult to explain. I was in family practice for 30 years in Mill Valley, and um, I must say that it took me, I may not be the smartest kid on the block, but uh, within about 10 years I figured out that uh, medicine, the way we practice it, isn't as uh, intelligent as it ought to be. We tend to have to wait till someone gets his diabetes or has his fracture or has his breast can her breast cancer or heart attack or stroke, and then we're supposed to step in and try to uh, somehow fix it. It struck me that it'd be a whole lot smarter to try to figure out where these things come from and then to alter people's choices, their lifestyle choices they're making, so to try to optimize their chance of being healthy and minimize their chance of getting these diseases. Because many of the things that we do end up with um, are things of long standing that gradually accumulate and gradually pass into some threshold where the disease becomes manifest. In uh, my case, I was sensitive to this because my father, who was the only doctor in a little town in Minnesota, had his first heart attack at 44 and died at age 49 when I was 15 years old. Now, I, when I got to medical school, I discovered you don't get a heart attack or get a fatal heart attack like that unless you've spent years and years and years accumulating the cholesterol plaque building up in your arteries. So it's, I, um, I tell you, at that moment, I quit drinking whole milk. Um, I haven't had a glass of milk since 1955 because uh, the... Uh, family history of heart disease in my family is uh, awful high. My dad, my two uncles, my only male cousin, uh, they all had serious heart attacks uh, in the early 40s or late 30s. And um, I'm the first Lee in our family in three generations, first male Lee to not only break 50, but break 60. I'll be 66 in another week or so. And uh, so even doing something right or I was adopted. <laughs> you don't know. But at any rate, my interest turned into prevention, me preventive medicine. Um, and uh, this has led me into all sorts of studies that I never dreamt of when I was in medical school. Medical school is more like a trade school, I have to admit. They teach you how to uh, uh, diagnose problems, and that means to classify them by their signs and symptoms uh, and to uh, respond with the treatment to treat whatever the sign or symptom was. If you have a bladder infection, you get sulfur. If you have hypertension, you get a diuretic, and so on. And uh, there wasn't much thought given to spending time tracking down where these things come from. And uh, so... I uh, accidentally got involved in the progesterone in a kind of peculiar way, I guess. In, um, in, my, in my practice, after you've been in practice 20 years, people who were 40 when you started are suddenly 60. 
um, people who are 30 are suddenly 50. Now, of course, you don't change, but all of a sudden you've got older people to take care of. And uh, osteoporosis was the, my entrance into the field here of progesterone. I thought I knew as much as anybody else about estrogen and progesterone in practice. Uh, but I had these people uh, developing uh, osteoporosis. And we had a doctor in town who developed a clinic to measure bone mineral density, Dr. Malcolm Powell. He'd been a professor at UC and developed a way of using photons. Like uh, kids at Halloween used to shine a flashlight through their hand and you could see the dark areas where the bone was and the pink areas where the, um, where the light went through. Uh, he had a machine that could measure how much light was lost in passing through. And the loss of the energy of the light beam could be calibrated to the, uh, to the density or the mass of minerals that were in the path of the beam. And then later, uh, the x-ray folks developed a very light dose x-ray to do the same thing. And they could measure the mass of the minerals in the path of the beam, any bone in your body. And uh, so we had these tests, uh, very accurate. They're about 96, 97 percent accurate to measure uh, bone mineral density loss. And I had these people with osteoporosis. The dilemma was, in 1976, that if we give estrogen, as we were taught, you increase the woman's risk of breast cancer and cancer of the uterus. This didn't seem right to me. I couldn't imagine Mother Nature making this dilemma. There's something wrong here. Um, but there it was. There was very solid evidence that um, unopposed estrogen is the only known cause of cancer of the uterus. And it was probably the cause of uh, at least 30% of the breast cancers. And there was a meeting at the Mayo Clinic in 1976 called a consensus meeting. Experts from around the world gathered and said, women should not be given estrogen unless you give some progesterone along with it because they found that progesterone protects against those cancers and that mother nature had always arranged for those two hormones to be made at the same time the ovary makes both hormones mother nature did not decide that women should be on estrogen by itself month after month year after year and yet that's what doctors were doing they were putting women postmenopausal women on just estrogen for their bones and they were creating uh, cancer of the uterus and breast cancer. So when the Mayo Clinic said that progesterone should be given, turns out there was no company selling natural progesterone, real, honest to God, human, female progesterone. So they were all making synthetic analogs that worked like progesterone in the sense that they could be used for birth control pills. Uh, so they jumped in and started advertising to the doctors, oh, we have a good progesterone here, use ours. So Provera came in, and Megastrol came in, and all these synthetics that we'll be talking about came in. Well, that uh, was all right, but a lot of doctors weren't using progesterone if a woman has already had a hysterectomy. The doctor would say, well, she can't get cancer of the uterus, uh, she's already had a hysterectomy. So they would still be giving unopposed estrogen. And I saw these patients who were on estrogen, and they were getting swollen breasts and fibrocystic breast disease, and they were getting fat around their middle and their hips and their abdomen and losing libido and getting depressed. When they traveled any place and they're sitting any period of time, their feet would swell and water retention and all that. And it struck me, there's something wrong here. And I had patients who couldn't take any estrogen because they've already had uh, breast cancer, or they had diabetes or vascular disorders or obesity. There's all sorts of, of contraindications for estrogen, gallbladder disease, um, migraines, hypertension, goes on and on. So I had patients with osteoporosis who couldn't take estrogen. And I was wondering, what can I do for these patients? I can tell them to eat a good diet. I can put them on calcium. I can put them on vitamin D. I can try to get them off cigarettes and all these things we're supposed to do. But we knew from the bone mineral density that that was not enough. The bones needed something that was going to get osteoporosis. So in 1978, I attended a meeting. Actually, I was giving a talk on hypoglycemia. Linus Pauling was there giving a talk on vitamin C. And Dr. Ray Pete, a PhD from Oregon, was there giving a talk to the doctors, challenging them, saying, why aren't you all using progesterone, the second female hormone? It's readily available. They can make it from yams. They can make it from soy. They can make it from 5,000 different plants. It's identical to what the humans make. It's been out for 30 years in face creams, cosmetics. It's wonderful for the skin. It's available. The FDA can't find anything wrong with it. Why are you using only estrogen for postmenopausal ladies? At menopause, the ovary doesn't make any more eggs doesn't make very much estrogen, your periods subside, and we call it menopause, and the doctors are just using estrogen. And Ray Pete was up there saying, look, I have a list of 250 references, and they show that progesterone is a very important hormone, and he listed all these important things. It's available over the counter. It's uh, absorbed through the skin. And I was sitting there, just my mind was blown by this. He said, I said, everything he's saying is right. 
That all makes sense. Dolby makes two hormones. Why aren't we giving the two hormones? So I got a hold of Ray Pete afterwards, and I said, I'd sure love a copy of your list of references. I'd like to look into this more. And I did. And I found more references, because every paper you get has another 150 references in it. So I accumulated quite a library of these references, and I found everything he said was corroborated by the references he had. And this was very impressive to me, because this doesn't always happen in medical papers. You know, in medical papers, some doctor might do something. He might make some observation, but then he goes and makes a conclusion. And in the process of making the conclusion, all sorts of underlying assumptions come into play. And a lot, a lot of times in medical papers, there's so much that is still unknown. And if they don't recognize the underlying assumptions, their conclusions can be wrong. Um, <coughs> it's, um, uh, medicine is not nearly as scientific as you might think, because there's so much that is unknown. The whole essence of life is impossible to understand in scientific terms. But at any rate, I was impressed with what Ray Pete had. So I told my patients, I said, I want you to go to uh, Dr. Malcolm Powell's office and get a dual photon bone mineral density test. And then I want you to go to the health food store and pick up some of this cosmetic cream. It was called Cielo at that time. C-I-E-L-O means blue or heaven, sky. And I want you to use that and um, rub a little bit in every day. And then a year from now, we're going to check and see how your bones are doing. So uh, these, over the next two or three years, I did this. And to my amazement, all of these women who had bad osteoporosis, otherwise I wouldn't have been willing to do this extraordinary thing, their bones were all getting better. And then I looked at the people who were on estrogen, their bones didn't get better. It was just that estrogen slowed down the loss. You see the difference? Estrogen does not reverse osteoporosis. Never has, never will. It's not its function. What estrogen does is to slow up bone loss by slowing up the cells that are resorbing old bone. Bone is interesting tissue. It's always being made, remade, unmade, made over again, just like skin, just like hair, just like the lining of your stomach, lining of your mucosa, any place. Bones are constantly being made, unmade, and then made anew. The cells that undo them are called osteoclasts, and they dissolve them away. When they find old bone, subject to more crystallization, fracture risk, higher, <clears throat> these cells identify the old bone, and they dissolve it away, little pockets of it here and there. Behind them comes the osteoblast. And the osteoblast comes in and makes new bone where the old bone had been removed. And in fact, the, the new bone can't be made unless the old bone is, re is removed first. So it's very, very important to have this happen. What estrogen does to slow up the dissolving away of the old bone does nothing to make new bone. Function of progesterone and testosterone, which is the same in this action, is to tell the cells that make new bone to get to work and make new bone wherever there's a spot for it. So you are increasing new bone formation when you give progesterone or testosterone. So um, my patients all did very well, even though they never took any estrogen at all. And pretty soon I accumulated quite a number of these people. And of course, they were telling other people. So other doctor's patients were coming over to my office and saying, what do you do? And I was telling them, you go get some of this cream over the counter and put a little dab on. And, and they said, how do you know how much to give? And I said, well, I certainly don't know. We're going to see what the tests show up a year later, but I know it can't hurt you because during a regular monthly cycle, the ovary normally makes 20 milligrams a day from ovulation time until the time of your period. And in pregnancy, the placenta makes it, and it makes up to 400 milligrams a day. So the safety range is somewhere between 20 milligrams a day and 400. You can't miss. A little dab of this cream is about 20 milligrams. So you're in the right ballpark. And the only way we'll tell is if we check the bone mineral density at the end of the year. So we did. And then I began learning things from these patients. They told me their energy level was higher. They told me that they um, could do a whole lot more work and that they could use up their body fat. Their body fat was slimming down. They were able to turn body fat into energy. Estrogen, on the other hand, turns the food energy into body fat. This is why they, uh, they give it to steers. You understand... Uh, they uh, castrate the steers, put them in feedlots, feed them sorghum, and give them estrogen. And steers, as you see, are sold by the pound. So the function of estrogen is to lard in a lot of fat in with the meat in a quick time, and also to retain water. And see, by retaining water, the weight goes up, so you get more per pound when you kill the steer for meat. And that's the function of estrogen. And that function is prevented when you take a progesterone. Progesterone allows you to use the fat for energy. The women were teaching me that their fibrocystic breasts had returned to normal breasts. 
the women were teaching me that those that had developed some acne and some uh, kind of uh, uh, pimples like uh, sometimes uh, teenage boys get, uh, and here they were, uh, postmenopausal women, that their skin had all cleared up. The women showed me that where their hair had been thinning, they now had full, luxuriant hair again. The women told me that uh, they had been previously bothered by fibroids, uh, and the fibroids were going down. Their doctor couldn't figure out why. Those that had water retention didn't have it anymore. Their edema had gone away. And those that had muscular aches and pains had gotten better. And I could never understand this until just uh, July of this year. There was an article in Science, the journal for the American Academy for Advancement of Science. It was an article about how the Schwann cell makes the myelin sheath that covers and protects all of the nerves as they pass through your body. There are little cells every couple centimeters that makes a covering, an insulation, called myelin, M-Y-E-L-I-N, myelin sheath, that protects the, the, the nerve uh, from damage, and it protects the nerve so it doesn't short circuit and lose its uh, electric pulse when the ner uh, nerve impulse comes down. Turns out the Schwann cell can't do this unless something interferes with its progesterone receptors. Progesterone is necessary to make the myelin sheath. Now, who ever knew that before? One of the problems in medicine is that they tend to label a hormone by some presumed function, a sex hormone, thyroid hormone. They don't realize that the reality is that the body is so much more complex that to label it by one function means you do not understand what that hormone does. They do so many things. In my research over the years, learning about progesterone, I discover brain cells concentrate progesterone and testosterone to levels 20 times higher than the blood carries. Now, brain cells wouldn't do this unless the progesterone or testosterone has some function in the brain cell. Why go to the work of drawing that progesterone in, holding it against an osmotic gradient, getting it through the cell membrane into the brain cell, unless there was some reason for it? So now I understood why some of my patients who gave this to their elder mothers and aunts who were in nursing homes and things, they gave it to them for their bones or because of their skin. It hydrates skin again, makes skin much better. These elderly women all became much more alert and aware, and women who were content just to lie in bed all day and couldn't keep track of a conversation with their niece or whatever, after a week or so of being on progesterone, they're up leading discussions on the headlines and the latest in book reviews. I had a doctor come all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil. He gave it to his 92-year-old mother, and her, this, this mother resumed being an intellectual giant again, where before she had become a, a baby-like uh, cripple. And uh, he is now, start, he specializes in care of the elderly. And he came all the way up from Sao Paulo, Brazil, to the little town where I live, Sebastopol, California, just to spend an afternoon talking to me about it. It helps brain function. So I was learning all this from the patients. It's not in the books. When I eventually did write a book about it, people said, they took it to their doctor, and their doctor said, well, this doesn't agree with things that I've read in my books. It's not in the other books. And I say, that's right. If it were already described, I wouldn't bother. But I was, I was doing something people hadn't done before, as far as I know. I wasn't doing it on one or two. I was doing it on everybody. I've probably had more experience giving natural progesterone to people than anybody you're ever going to meet. I've been doing it since 1978. I retired in 1989, but my old patients keep, keep me informed, and people are calling all the time since the book came out. I get 50, 60 phone calls a day. I'm in more touch with, pe with more people now than ever uh, in, in my practice. So I was learning this. So then I decided, here I've got all these people on estrogen, and they're not getting better. I'm slowing up their bone loss, but I'm not doing anything to reverse it. Why not add some progesterone to them? And this is where I learned one of the most important lessons. When I give this to a woman whose doctor has her on estrogen, turns out the dose he has ordered is always two, four, eight times too much. And I was trying to figure out, is the doctor that dumb? Or what has happened here? Why is it that when I give them progesterone, they get estrogen side effects? They get breast swelling, they get water retention, they get headaches, their feet swell. That's estrogen. Well, it dawned on me, finally, when I read, I looked it up, and it turns out, when you have the same hormone all the time, like estrogen, unopposed by progesterone, the estrogen receptors tune down. Just as if you're working in an office where there's too much noise. After working there for six months, you end up not noticing the noise. And then you go away for two weeks and come back and you say, my God, how could I have been working here without realizing all this noise is here? Same thing happens with light. You've been out in the bright daylight sometime, and you go into a matinee movie, you can't see anything for 45 minutes, your eyes have tuned down. Constant exposure to the same message tunes down the message. 
And hormones are like messengers. And every cell that they work on does so because there's a receptor already made to bind and unite with that hormone molecule and go to the nucleus and create the effect of the message. But it takes binding with that receptor. And when you have unopposed estrogen, the receptors tune down. When you add the progesterone, the receptors come back to full force again, full efficiency. So I learned that every time I added this to a woman already on estrogen, I had to tell her to cut her estrogen at least in half. And then later she could cut it down even more. Because the progesterone was handling so many of her problems, she didn't need all that much estrogen. And then I had some ladies who kept cutting it down, cutting it down. Pretty soon they weren't taking any. And they were doing fine. No hot flashes, no vaginal dryness, no problems. They were doing fine. I said, how can this be? I was taught in medical school, estrogen goes to zero. So I went to the library and looked up the original references of people, primary reference where somebody measured estrogen levels for five years before menopause and then five years after menopause. And you know what they all found? Every single one, they found the estrogen only drops about 40, 50 percent. It doesn't go to zero. Women continue to make estrogen even if they have their ovaries removed. And how do they make it? The fat cells make it. The body fat converts one of the hormones that the adrenal gland makes, androstenedione, into real estrogen. And the greater your need for estrogen, the more it makes. The body's not dumb. The body has this backup mechanism, and it works. And in fact, the tests show that a fat lady after menopause makes more estrogen than a skinny lady does before menopause. Isn't that something? And you have all these doctors giving fat ladies estrogen. There's something wrong here. And it became more and more apparent to me. I learned all this from the patients. Then I would go try to find a reference to explain it, try to understand it. People say, what kind of doctor are you? They want me to say family practice or internist or surgeon or whatever. Granted, it was family practice. I say, I'm the kind of doctor who is a puzzle solver. I can't walk by somebody doing a puzzle without trying to figure out what the puzzle is or adding a piece here and there. I'm the kind of a doctor who, when he hears that three doctors out of four prefer ibuprofen over something else, I always wonder, what does that fourth guy know the other three don't? You know, don't you have that? Um, but I, I think I have this compulsion to solve puzzles, and um, especially in um, natural science type things. And then I get a compulsion to want to tell people what I found. And I figured out that's what I'm doing here. I got nothing to sell. I don't have any interest in any of the companies that make these creams. I wrote a book two years ago trying to tell them. I wrote first a series of about five or six papers. Um, the American journals wouldn't publish them because they said Dr. Lee doesn't have a control group. I was showing them that people with osteoporosis get better when you add progesterone. That's never happened before in the history of womankind. There isn't any uh, other study that shows that. Uh, and that estrogen doesn't do it. It's kind of like if somebody says all sheep are white. You do not have to do a double blind control. All you got to do is find one black sheep. Right? And you've just proved that. If you say osteoporosis cannot be reversed, and I do it on 100 patients, I don't need a control group. I'm doing something that's reversing osteoporosis. And they ought to be looking into it. And I wasn't in a position to do double-blind studies because the people were coming to me for advice on how to use the progesterone they could buy over the counter. So I'm trying to tell them what I've learned. And so this is what happened. So I've learned all these things, and I'm trying to tell. So I wrote the papers, and the, one was, the first one was published in an Australian journal, which is recognized around the world, International Journal of um, uh, something with nutrition. But it's a real good journal around the world. Next one was in an uh, English journal, Medical Hypotheses. Next one was in a Canadian journal. And um, bit by bit, uh, this was getting news around. Then there was a letter to Lancet. Lancet had shown that these uh, hormones are well absorbed through the skin. And so I wrote, yes, I know. I've been doing this. And it reverses osteoporosis. And they published it. And uh, then I got, began to get letters from doctors all around the world. And my wife said, why don't you put it all together in a, in a, in a book? Uh, I'd given talks at our local hospitals, Marin General and Ross Hospital, showing these uh, bones getting better on these people. I mean, I didn't, do, I had to, I ordered the test, but I had nothing to do with making the test. And the people were using the protest. There was no way I could interfere with the results. And uh, the doctors would say, wow, they've never seen anything like this before. But uh, none of them would do it in their practice. Here it was available. They all had patients with osteoporosis. They were still doing the same dumb thing. But one by one, they would call me and they'd say, John, uh, 
my mother-in-law is visiting and she has terrible osteoporosis. How is it that you use this cream? Or they'd say, my wife has PMS. Uh, how do we do this? Or my wife has fibrocystic breast disease. Or my wife is having to take thyroid. Progesterone helps the thyroid hormone work. Estrogen interferes with the thyroid hormone. And this wasn't my discovery. This was described in the 50s in a study in Lancet. It doesn't interfere with the gland. It interferes with how the thyroid hormone is working. So the person acts as if they're low thyroid, but the blood tests of T3 and T4 uh, are okay. But the doctor often ends up giving more thyroid and can overcome this sluggishness of the thyroid by giving more of it, so he thinks he's doing a good job. And if you do that, forcing more thyroid hormone than the cells really need, you set up the stage for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And that was described 30, 40 years ago. No, I, it became apparent in my practice when I would measure progesterone levels that progesterone deficiency is a very common malady long before menopause. This is never taught in medical school. No one ever thinks of measuring progesterone levels. Some woman, they'll say, well, after 43 or 44, it's harder for you to get pregnant, and you may have periods till you're 55, but they never say it's harder for you to get pregnant because the ovary isn't making progesterone. Let me tell you a little bit about what progesterone does. The main purpose of progesterone <coughs> is to procreate the species. When the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus, pituitary, first you have the hypothalamus, then the pituitary, sends down signals to the ovary to get to work to start the period over again. That signal is called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Follicles are little nests of cells in the ovaries, each containing the capability of one egg. One egg is already made and resting in there. It has to be developed, made full, and then it's, when one is made released, that follicle then becomes corpus luteum, which then becomes a factory for making progesterone. But anyway, the first response of the ovary to follicle stimulating hormone is to make estrogen. And at the same time, the follicle, 150 follicles or so, are developing an egg. And when the first egg is released and the progesterone starts being manufactured, that progesterone tells the other follicles to relax, quit, they don't have to do their job because they've got, this one has one good egg out. When that egg meets up with the sperm, it is able to signal back to the ovary, don't stop your progesterone manufacture, make more. Progesterone is necessary to maintain that secretory uh, uh, lining in the uterus. The uterus develops this nice bloody lining in the uterus as a nest to be able to nourish the fertilized egg and to sustain it. And if you have a fall off of progesterone at that point, it will initiate a shedding, a monthly, like a monthly shedding, and you will lose the pregnancy. So the ovary is very important. It has to make more progesterone at that point. The fertilized egg in the blastula stage, when it might be only eight cells, signals the ovary make more progesterone. Isn't that amazing? We don't even know. The signal, by the way, is human chorionic anatotrophin. But the first business of the fertilized egg is to tell the ovary to keep on making it. Then, as the ovary does that and the embryo develops, then the placenta develops. And the placenta gradually takes over the function of making progesterone. And it makes more and more and more as the pregnancy goes on. So that in the last three months of pregnancy, instead of making 20 milligrams a day, you are making 400 milligrams a day. There's no ovary, there's no hormone in your body that makes hormones <clears throat> that is made in such a prodigious amount. That's a ton of hormone and doesn't hurt anybody. In fact, women are healthiest in the last three months of their pregnancy. Think of that. So here's the hormone which is absolutely necessary for the embryo to survive from conception all the way up to time of birth. And that period of time is called gestation time. You all know that, gestation time. The hormone that promotes that is progestation hormone, progesterone. There's no mystery. The problem is when people learn that role, they think they understand progesterone. Instead, progesterone is involved all through the body, from the nerves to the brain cells to thyroid gland, fat metabolism, energy, muscle building. Just imagine all the things. It's during pregnancy that you can burn your body fat to help the baby grow. Estrogen helps you when you're not pregnant so that you turn food into body fat. So that gives you a survival benefit during times of famine. Women will outlive men if they live in a society that has occasional famine. Mother Nature is very clever. But when you're pregnant, you want to be able to use that energy for the baby. And that's the role of progesterone. 
There are so many roles. It causes hydration, proper water uh, in the skin. It protects the cell membranes, so the cell membranes can keep sodium out and allow potassium magnesium to come into the cell. It maintains the intracellular concentration of the good minerals and keeps out the sodium. Uh, so otherwise, if the sodium comes in, then water comes in, and then you get swelling. Uh, and you, did you know that on all these synthetic progestins, we've got to be clear, there's a little semantic problem that doctors have with this. Progesterone, as you all know, is the name of the hormone made by the corpus luteum, the follicle that has released the egg. The ovary makes progesterone. What I did, oh, here it is, on my book, I put that molecule right there. That is progesterone. Nothing else is. When the companies want to give you some progesterone, something with progesterone activity, they go back to the discovery that Dr. Russell Marker made in 1938. He found that in plants, there are fats and oils called saponins, where the word sap comes from. These are fats and oils that plants make. Now, the plants don't make cholesterol like humans do, other animals do, but they make sterols that are very similar. Plants don't make real progesterone. They make fats and oils that are very similar to this molecule, and one in particular is called diostrinin. And in 1938, Dr. Russell E. Marker, down in the middle of America someplace, discovered the steps of how to convert that saponin into real, honest-to-God, natural progesterone. Called natural because it's natural for humans. And it's that molecule. He, it's able to be made. So these companies that want to sell you progesterone, the pharmaceutical companies, they can't make any money selling that molecule because that cannot be patented. That's a natural molecule. You can't patent natural things. They deliberately alter this molecule. They add different acetate groups over here and a methyl group over here, and they make something that Mother Nature never made. But it may still have one or two of the effects of progesterone, enough so it will, say, convince the ovary that the other ovary is already ovulated, and they can use it then as a birth control pill or to hold in the, anything that holds in the bloody lining uh, can be called a progestin. It doesn't matter what it is. They make them out of testosterone. They make them out of horse urine. They make them out of the real stuff. The companies have these huge farms growing the wild yam in Mexico. And they make this progesterone. And then they deliberately alter it into Provera and Megastraw. Now it no longer has the full range of activity. Plus it's loaded with uh, toxic side effects. That's what they're selling people. They use this same hormone to make testosterone for males. They make their estrogens out of this hormone. They can make all the corticosterones, the cortisol, the hydrocortisone, all of these things can be made out of this molecule. This is the, the mother of all the other molecules. They can be made by chemical factors, just the way the body. The body makes this out of cholesterol. And the body then uses this as a precursor for all the other steroid hormones. And so throughout the book, I have, I show how this happens. You can't see this, but this is cholesterol, pregnenolone, and progesterone. From progesterone, you start making all the cortisones, and you end up making all the estrogens, and you make testosterone. But without that, you can't do that. So it has a million different roles. That's why I called it the multiple role of a remarkable hormone. So I think you get the idea that by my experience with these women, intelligent women telling me, teaching me, I learned an awful lot about progesterone. I feel an obligation to tell people what I've learned about progesterone. And I found that it's very well absorbed through the skin, 40 to 70 times more efficiently than if you take it by mouth. There are companies that are making progesterone pills. Anybody that wants to can buy this progesterone on, on the wholesale market. And some people are putting it into pills. Well, I looked up some of the studies that have been done. And the skin is 40 to 70 times more efficient, which means if I give somebody 10 or 20 milligrams by a little glop of the cream, and it's well absorbed, the doctor might then give the person 200 to 400 orally, 200 400 milligrams orally, 10 to 20 times greater. Because when you take it orally, being fat soluble like vitamin E, beta carotene, um, vitamin A, and so on, it goes to the liver, and the liver um, excretes it in bile metabolizes it, conjugates it, and binds it to bile, and out it goes. And the person only ends up with about 5% of what you gave them. In the meantime, you put the liver to all this extra work, and you're creating artificial metabolites um, that aren't the same, and you don't know what the function is. There's no reason not to use the skin. The skin is by far better. If you were to look up estrogen 
like the estradiol that's in the patch. You all know about uh, uh, estroderm patches. You know, how many how many people know about it? Yeah, everybody. If you look up the month, the weekly dose of the patch, and then turn to the PDR, the physician desk reference, look up the same company which sells not only the patch but they sell oral pills. The same dose to get the same effect taken orally has to be 70 times higher. So therefore, the skin is 70 times more efficient. Isn't that something? And uh, this doesn't apply to everything, but it applies to these particular molecules. These are slightly smaller than a cholesterol molecule. They're fat soluble. They have the right sort of electromagnetic charge. They pass through the skin, get picked up by the fat underneath. From the fat underneath, it gets into the bloodstream. It rides around in the red blood cells. I used to have doctors uh, who see a patient who was on the progesterone. And they'd say, well, let's do a blood test. They'd draw a serum or plasma level, and they wouldn't find much there. And they'd say, oh, this is a cream must be a fake. Well, this has been answered now. There's a beautiful study uh, done in April. Some French doctors gave some women uh, some uh, progesterone cream, and they measured it in the bloodstream, in the serum. They also measured the change in the breast tissue. Turns out the breast tissue concentration went up 100 times, but the serum concentration didn't change at all. How did it get to the breast? By the blood. What part of the blood? On the old good red blood cells and the, and the chylomicrons, but not in the watery plasma, because fat and water don't mix. Now, when the ovary makes it, prior to menopause, it wraps it in a protein, which makes it water-soluble. But the amount that's bound to the protein is not biologically active. Only 1 to 9% of the level the doctor finds in the serum is biologically active. The rest stays bound to the protein. So even though the doctor gets higher numbers when it's made by the ovary, he doesn't know that only 1 to 9% of it is actually working. So this is just another way of showing the doctor does the test, he draws the blood serum, the lab tells him they don't find much progesterone, the doctor draws the wrong conclusion. His conclusion is that cream isn't working. But the patient says, well, my fibrocystic breast disease, breasts have turned back to normal. My bones are getting better. The doctor says, placebo. <laughs> the doctor doesn't even think, I'm looking in the wrong part of the blood. Isn't that something? You see how conclusions can be made from a finding, and the conclusions are, are just uh, 180 degrees wrong. But the doctor doesn't know unless he thinks about progesterone. I would say 99.9% .9 of all the people who call me and all the patients I've seen over the years who have seen other doctors, the doctor has never once measured their progesterone level. We now have a better way. The World Health Organization for the last five years has been using saliva. The saliva gland, when it makes the saliva, in the process, excretes in the saliva all the corticosterols, all the cortisone, the testosterone, the estrogen, the progesterone, the DHEA. It's all in saliva. And now they can be calculated from the level in the saliva. You can calculate what the, what the body level is. And it only excretes the biologically active form. So you're getting a direct or a proportionate measure of the body levels, biologically active hormone by using saliva. World Health Organization uses it because, number one, it's accurate. Number two, saliva can be stored without changing the numbers. Number three, it's relevant. It's really measuring the, the biologically active form. Number four, it's cheaper. Number five, it's easier to get. When you're out doing nations of people and cities and colonies and tribes and people all around the world, it's much easier to get saliva specimens than it is to go out with nurses and come back with blood tests that have to be analyzed within 12 hours. Now this is available. And uh, in the book, I tell, for instance, there's a lab in California, Dr. Zava's lab, Aaron lab, and he's been uh, doing these tests on people for three years now himself, and they're very accurate, and they're much less expensive than blood tests. And he's developed a mailing kit. People can call him on a free 800 number. He may send you a mailing kit, and you collect your saliva, send it back, and he'll tell you what your estrogen and progesterone levels were. You don't even have to go to the doctor. Well, you get these levels, and he has enough of an explanation, so then you can show it to your doctor, and the doctor will be able to learn. You can teach your doctor. They're teachable. Not very, but, uh, but with effort, you can. Okay, now we're coming to the second part of my talk. I'm going to explain how all this came about. Remember I told you that I didn't think Mother Nature would put women to this? There has to be a reason. When I first got into it, I thought, oh, it's our bad diet. We uh, in America eat way too much animal fat. We eat way too much sugars and highly refined foods. We eat way too much uh, milk products with all the milk ho cow's hormones in there. And homogenized milk is a very unnatural thing. It shouldn't be drunk by uh, uh, grown-ups. Um, 
There's no animal in the world with breasts whose children come back and continue to drink their mother's milk when they grow up. And they ask us to drink this mother's milk of this other animal. Craziness. 75% of the people around the world live where there's no milk. There are no cows. And they grow up, they got good bones, good teeth, and they beat us at the Olympics every four years. There's no reason to drink milk. Anyway, I thought it was diet. Then the other thing I was thinking about it was stress. We know that the control of these hormones emanates from uh, the hypothalamus, a center in our brain, the limbic brain. The limbic brain is this, where all the stress uh, manifests itself. All of these computer-like things for stomach acid and for blood pressure and, and rapid pulse and having to urinate or, or bear it or, or blushing or making urine or anything, it all comes through computers in that part of the brain. Can you imagine? You get a little embarrassed, you turn red all over. That's blushing. You don't plan to do this. It's not, a, it's not a, a thing you can tell your body to do. In fact, then you only blush down to where the blouse line is. Isn't that interesting? How does the brain know that? Imagine all the, how clever the darn brain is. Well, at any rate, it's the brain that sends the signals to the pituitary to tell the ovary when to start the period and when to stop. And we know that at college age, when women have the most definite periods of all time, if they have some emotional stress, it can throw their periods off break up of a relationship, a test that they did badly on, losing out at some silly sorority house. Whatever it is, it can mess up their periods. We also know you can take three unrelated women, have them room together during college time, and by the end of the year, their periods are all in synchrony. Isn't that something? They didn't plan that. The brain does that. So I thought diet, stress. But still I thought, well, we've had bad diet and stress all the lives, of, all the time the people have been on earth. Why is this happening to people now? They're getting breast cancer, they're getting PMS, they're getting fibrocystic breast disease, they're getting more of it, they're getting it earlier, and it's, and it's, more, and it's more intense, and breast cancers are worse. We're not winning the war against breast cancer. No amount of mammograms is going to do it. No amount of self-examination is going to do it. It doesn't change anything. We're getting more breast cancer. And uh, where is all this coming from? Well, we know that estrogen makes it. We know that progesterone protects against it. Well, what's happened to progesterone when we do measurements? For instance, Dr. Jerry Lynn Pryor, chief of uh, women's uh, endocrinology up at the University of British Columbia uh, in uh, Vancouver. She tested female athletes who were getting osteoporosis. 24-year-old long-distance runner, breaks her leg, their hip. They have osteoporosis. And the common thought is, oh, they're running so hard, their fat level is down, they're not making estrogen. She tested that, and she found the estrogen was fine. The progesterone was gone. Lack of progesterone makes osteoporosis. See, I like that particular reference because here I was seeing people with osteoporosis and I was giving them progesterone and their bones were getting better. And she was seeing young people who have low progesterone and their bones were getting worse. So it all fits. See, isn't that nice? Well, she thought it was due to the running. Then she tested women who weren't marathon runners. And she found that by the time 35, 50% of the women in North America are missing their progesterone. Whoa. By 35... 50% of you aren't making the progesterone you ought to be making. And then, a study done by Dr. Uh, Peter Ellison, who was working for the World Health Organization with his saliva hormone assay, he was asked to uh, use his uh, uh, little uh, device, saliva business, to test a long-standing theory that at the time of ovulation, women make a burst of testosterone to explain their increased libido at the time of ovulation. It's kind of a male conceit, I think, to think that it has to be testosterone to make women have a burst of some extra libido. But he took 18 normally healthy, um, sexually active women, and using his saliva, he measured testosterone every day for three cycles to see if a spurt of testosterone coincided with ovulation. But he knew that he had to find out when the ovulation time was. So he also had to do progesterone levels every day during the three cycles because you make progesterone unless you do ovulate. So to his amazement, out of these 18 women, the average age was 29, seven of them were not ovulating. Whoa, seven out of 18, average age 29, normal, functioning, sexually active women, didn't have any progesterone. Something strange is going on here. Now we have, I think, the full circle. We have an epidemic of illnesses related to progesterone deficiency. And I have defined a condition I call estrogen dominance that results. 
In other words, with the diet that we have, by the way, um, Dr. Ellison found that the other factor in raising women's estrogen levels higher than normal is the total amount of extra calories that we eat in this country. If we look at other countries in the third world, the amount of calories they eat barely matches the amount of physical energy that they spent. If you reduce the amount of calories you eat, estrogen levels fall. If you increase the amount of calories you eat in relation to the expenditure, estrogen levels rise. Dr. Ellison says that if the doctors believe the lab tests that come back, where it says the normal range of estrogen is truly normal, it means the doctors don't understand what's going on. Our normals are merely typical results found at this time in America. It doesn't mean it's good for people. Don't ever understand that normal in medical terms means good. Normal means you just take 100 people and see what the results are and you find the uh, average or the mean and then you take two standard deviations, knock off 3.5% on either end, and that's called normal. He said the normals in the, in the petrochemical societies are so high in comparison to uh, the 75% of the people who are in so-called emerging or third world countries that we are the abnormals. So we have an abnormally high estrogen level because, in general, so many people eat more than their work really needs. We have a lot of workers who are not spending a lot of physical energy like they do in the third world countries. So you all have extra high estrogen. You have extra low progesterone because your follicles are not able to produce the progesterone having been damaged by these petrochemicals. You have a very, so we have a very strange mix, and I call it estrogen dominance, and it's due to the high estrogen from the diet it's due to the high estrogen the doctors are giving the people. Every woman over 40 who goes to the doctor with any complaint at all is going to get an estrogen prescription. Guaranteed. The third factor is that your progesterone is low. So the balance, you see, favors the estrogen. That's why I call it estrogen dominant. I went back to Minnesota for my 40th medical school class reunion this last June. Got to talk to a lot of my colleagues and their wives. Every one of them at my age, 65, 66, they're on estrogen or they've had their breasts operated on, or they've had a hysterectomy, or they've had the change, uh, their body fat has increased, and they have all these side effects. And now that I'm familiar with all this, I recognize estrogen dominance all over the place. Then my sister arranged a family meeting. There's all sorts of cousins and nieces and nephews and second cousins and second nephews and nieces that I never met in the last 40 years, and we had a get-together at somebody's cabin on a lake in Minnesota. It's a very Scandinavian thing to do. You get together at somebody's cabin on a lake despite the mosquitoes and the, uh, the algae and the water and everything. But anyway, we all got together, and uh, it was fun to see all these kids I never had seen before. And, but I got talking to some of the mothers, and I talked to four or five of them. They're all 40, 45, 50 years old now. Every single one has had a hysterectomy already. Story's all the same. They hit 40, 42. They notice a little change going on in their periods. They're putting on a little way more weight. Their breasts are a little more full, sometimes tender. They have headaches more. They lose interest in uh, sex. Uh, uh, their body's changing, and they, uh, they don't like it, what's happening. They're not sleeping as well. They go to the doctor, and he says, well, my dear, you're approaching menopause. You need estrogen. The doctor never measures the progesterone. What it means to me is they've been low on progesterone for five or six years already, and these things are happening. So he puts them on estrogen, and after a month or two, they come back and say, I don't think that's working so well. I'm bloating up even more. My breasts are even more swollen. And uh, uh, there's, uh, I don't, oh, that's because I didn't give you enough. So he raises the estrogen level. Then she starts getting spotting and more blood and starts getting clots along with some of her periods because this is stimulating to the lining of the uterus to make more stuff. So he said, oh, this might be cancer. We better do a DNC. So they have a DNC and he finds, guess what? Hyperplasia. He made the hyperplasia. The, uh, the, that's the whole function of estrogens. Tell those cells to multiply, divide, make more. He made the hyperplasia. And he says, hyperplasia is the first sign that you're developing cancer of the uterus. You might as well, we've got an appointment for you next Wednesday to have your uterus out. Every single one of them went for it. Isn't that something? We've got to change the doctors. How do we do that? We get intelligent, assertive women who understand what the problem is, and they educate the doctors. That's what we got to do. I want to add one more thing. Dr. Uh, Zaba at the uh, Aaron Labs, I was saying, he's become very interested in this. In addition to doing progesterone levels on human saliva, 
He's been doing progesterone levels on all the creams that have come out. Are you aware that since I wrote my book two years ago, more companies are jumping in with all sorts of creams, are advertising themselves as if they've got the progesterone cream? One is called uh, Progerone, Progestone, HP, and all these things. He's been analyzing them for progesterone content. Turns out there's only five or six that have the progesterone that I think is physiologically normal. The cream that I've always used has 400 to 480 milligrams of progesterone per ounce. So I could tell people to use an ounce a month over 24 days, and then I know they're going to get 20 milligrams a day. You see how simple that is. Doctors will say, how does Dr. Lee know how much to give? Well, 20 milligrams a day is the normal amount that the ovary makes, and that's what I want people to have is a physiological normal amount. And it was easy when it was that. Here's a whole bunch of creams that only have 2 milligrams per ounce. And then there's another bunch of creams that you couldn't find any. Two milligrams spread out over 30 days is nothing. And nothing spread out over 30 days is also nothing. And there's only four or five others that uh, did. Two of them are made by Bezweck. And uh, they have a um, marketing scheme. Uh, they will only sell it through doctor's prescriptions. It's not that the cream is any different or better. Or anything. It's perfectly fine. I'm nothing against it. But what they want to do is to get it through the doctor's uh, prescription. They want to get their foot in the door so the doctors know about their cream. Because what happened in England was, see, I've been going there the last two summers telling people about the same thing, and the women have been buying all this. There are forces in the, the economy that can't allow this to be just open like this and let good stuff in the hands of regular people. So they've made it prescription only in England. It's been out for years as a cosmetic at the same dose. No sign of any side effect. Never has hurt anybody. Uh, but now they made a prescription. So Bezwekin thinks it's going to maybe be prescription in the United States. So they, they have a marketing scheme, so you can't buy it over the counter. But the others you can buy. And they're very good. They're all, they're all fine. But the thing I wanted to tell you about is doctors have said, well, how does Dr. Lee know these things? It's circumstantial evidence. He's counting up uh, the patients who get better. Maybe it's the diet he put them on. Maybe because uh, it's placebo. Maybe they believe. I always, when they bring that up, I say, well, if it's placebo, it's really good placebo. You know, it works. And, uh, and it's been working now for 15, 16 years. But it's true. No one has done a double-blind study until recently. Love it. There's some French doctors in Taiwan with some Taiwan uh, doctors who had 40 female patients lined up, young, menstruating, healthy female patients lined up for some minor breast surgery. Ten days before the breast surgery, they gave a fourth of them a cream, just like the Happy PMS cream, same dose. Ten days before, and they rubbed a, a little dab in, making 20 milligrams a day, 25 milligrams a day for 10 days. The other group was given an estrogen cream. Let's see what would happen. Third group was given a mix of the two creams, combination. Very good. The fourth one was given a placebo cream with no hormone in it. So we had four groups out of 40 women. They all had their surgery 10 days later, and at the time of surgery, they were able to get some breast tissue. And from the breast tissue, they measured the hormone concentration. So you had the placebo group. So that was the background hormone concentration, typical woman without any hormone. Those that were receiving the progesterone, their progesterone concentration went up 100 times to nice, normal, full progesterone levels as if she had ovulated. See, The ones that got the estrogen cream, they rose like 100 times higher, too. So this test right there proved that both estrogen and progesterone are well absorbed through the skin. They get to the target tissues in full physiological concentrations. He also measured, these doctors also measured, was it in the blood plasma during these days? How much was in the blood serum? And when they did that, they couldn't find any progesterone in the serum at all. The serum is a watery part of the blood. No cells, no fats, no nothing, just the watery part. The doctors have been measuring the wrong part of the blood all of these years. Isn't that amazing? Having proven that it gets from the skin to the breast tissue, it had to get there somehow. It was carried by the blood, but it was carried on red blood cell membranes and fatty things, and not in the serum. I hope you see that distinction. When the doctor says, we did a blood test, you should say, what part of the blood did you use, doctor? Well, I used the watery part. Why did you do that? This is a fat-soluble thing we're looking for. So uh, you can help educate the doctors this way. Right. Then they did two tests on the breast tissue, two different ways of counting how fast the breast cells in the milk ducts were multiplying. You understand cancer is not something out there. 
Cancer is a normal cell which multiplies itself more rapidly than it ought to. That's what cancer is. So they're looking to see how fast the breast milk duct cells are multiplying. And they know what the normal rate was because they could see it on the women who were receiving the placebo cream. On those receiving the progesterone cream, it dropped the rate to about 15% of what the normal was. It slowed those cells down. They could take their time. The instruction of progesterone to cells all over your body is slow up, relax, don't multiply so fast, mature, differentiate, become what you're supposed to become. The estrogen women, taking women, that put estrogen on their skin, their cells were multiplying at a rate 250% faster. The message of estrogen is get to work, multiply, make more of yourselves, proliferate, become more. That's what you don't want. It happens on fat cells, it happens on the breast cells, it happens on the cells inside the uterus, it happens wherever estrogen has a receptor. It stimulates cell proliferation. Unopposed by progesterone, that leads to cancer. Now we got the fourth group that had the combination cream. And the question was, who's going to win? Is the estrogen part of it going to stimulate more rapid proliferation, or is the progesterone part going to, going to uh, hold it down? Well, on the dose they used, progesterone won. It kept the dose, the proliferation rate down in the low normal range. Stop that estrogen from multiplying. So now we see what we've got is an epidemic of estrogen dominance going on. And the estrogen can come from the xenoestrogens. It can come from the estrogens the doctors are giving inappropriately. It can come from the more estrogen you make because you're eating more fat and more sugars and more calories than you truly need. And it can come from the fact that your ovaries are not making the right amount of progesterone. So what can you do about it? Pretty simple. You quit overeating. You quit exposing yourself to all the xenoestrogens by eating food that doesn't have animal fat in it. What do we call that food? Veggies. Plant food. We get along fine with plant food. We get all the protein, all the vitamins, all the amino acids, all the minerals. Everything comes from plants. All we need is a variety. Variety of plants. Doesn't matter. You can eat any particular plant you want as long as you eat a variety. You should eat the whole plant. Eat the leaves, the stems, the stalks, the roots, the tubers the flowers, the fruit, the whole works, and eat them as unprocessed as possible. Eat them the way your grandparents ate vegetables. They had gardens. They went out and picked them. Okay. And then you can measure, have your doctor or have yourself, have your progesterone measured. If you are over 35, and if you are having any of these changes we're talking about, swollen breasts, fibrocystic uh, breasts, uh, uh, more water retention, loss of libido, obesity, uh, depression, uh, low thyroid, these are all signs of low progesterone. The only way you're going to find out is to measure for it. And the measurement should be the saliva test. See, I didn't have access to the saliva test in the many years that I've been doing this. I did it just because I learned to recognize uh, estrogen dominance. It isn't that tough. Anyone who does this any period of time, they'll pick up on it very easily. The woman herself will know. The best laboratory in the world is the, the woman's body herself. It's good for PMS, uh, which is strictly estrogen dominance. Uh, dosage has to be individualized. That's not strange. We're all individuals. We all differ. It's safe to use. The skin that's well absorbed is through the face, the neck, the hands, the upper chest, the inside of the arms, wherever there's thinner skin and large areas and plenty of capillaries. So every place you can blush, every place that your skin is relatively thin and well, if you look at palms, they tend to be pink. And the pink palms mean there's more capillaries there. Isn't that amazing? I think of the couples that I've uh, taught over the years um, advising the male part of the couple to go ahead and massage it into the uh, female uh, partner and now I realize the male was getting more of it than she was. <laughs> Personally, it doesn't hurt males at all. Males make progesterone. They need it to make their testosterone and for the adrenal glands to make cortisone. So males make it. You can measure male progesterone levels. And you'll find that when the woman has this follicle damage I'm talking about, the amount of progesterone she makes is less than that of a male. So it's a big difference. It's not like shades of gray. It's not hard to find. So the saliva levels are now uh, very easy to do, and, um, and progesterone can be given, and people will learn as they do this. So here we have the whole story of how I got, it helps the bones. That led me to learn more and more about progesterone, things that I learned from the uh, patients. And, uh, that has led me then to look for the causes of what, why a woman would be low in progesterone. And now we have the reason for the low progesterone, the fact that the ovaries have been damaged by petrochemicals uh, in our, in the, our uh, uh, environment. So um, 
uh, perhaps that should be enough for a while, but uh, we can we can answer answer questions. So thank you very much.